It's easy to forget because it's often completely ignored in Western media outlets, but around one quarter of the global population lives in countries that are targeted by illegal sanctions by the United States and the European Union. And in some countries, these sanctions have caused serious economic suffering. Of course, there has been a little more attention to the sanctions that the West imposed on Russia in 2022. And President Joe Biden famously claimed that the U.S. was going to try to turn the Russian ruble into rubble. And of course, the sanctions have not done that. They've done some damage, but not nearly as much as the West expected. But there are other regions of the world where sanctions have been completely devastating. And today I'm going to be briefly talking about Venezuela, a country that has been suffocated by illegal Western sanctions. The top United Nations human rights official just visited Caracas, Venezuela, and there he met with Venezuelan government officials. He met with leaders from the right wing opposition. He met with civil society groups. He met with religious organizations. And then he released a statement condemning the sanctions on Venezuela and calling for them to be lifted. Now, you probably didn't see any reporting on this because it was completely ignored by the Western media. They only cherry picked all of the negative comments he said criticizing Venezuela. They didn't mention, they conveniently left out the parts where he condemned Western sanctions on Venezuela. And there's a photo here of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk. He is an Austrian lawyer and UN official, and he's the one who took this trip to Venezuela. I just want to very briefly here look at some of the comments that he made, because again, you're not going to hear it in mainstream media reports. This is the official declaration that was published by the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights on January 28th. And he had a long statement, but if you go down to, to the part where he talks about sanctions in his statement, he says very clearly that I heard from across the spectrum of people I spoke to, including humanitarian actors and UN agencies, about the impact of sectorial sanctions on the most vulnerable segments of the population and the hurdles sanctions create for the country's recovery and development, not least in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. So he makes it clear here that this is, these are not just statements coming from government officials. People across the spectrum that he spoke to, including the right-wing opposition, civil society groups, humanitarian groups, they all said that the, seg the, the, the Western sanctions on Venezuela have created hurdles for the country's recovery and development and caused damage to the most vulnerable segments of the population. He said, people I met described their struggle to get basic and essential products to sustain their livelihoods, the impossibility of finding medicines their loved ones so badly need, and the mental impact, anxiety, and depression of failing, falling ever further into debt to survive. So he's saying that these are all a direct product of the Western sanctions, which are completely illegal, which violate international law. He does say that the roots of economics, economic crisis predate the imposition of sanctions. But actually, he actually is a, mis is a bit misleading here. He says that the sanctions were imposed in 2017, but actually he's ignoring another report that his own UN colleague published, which acknowledges that US sanctions go back to 2015. So I'm, I'm not uncritically praising this UN official. He himself has his own biases, but he does acknowledge that the sanctions have exacerbated the economic crisis and hindered human rights. So he's acknowledging that the Western sanctions have made the economic problems worse and hurted the human rights of Venezuelans. And here he's very roundabout, he's very indirect in his statement here, but he does say that the UN Office and the High Commissioner of Human Rights has repeatedly recommended that UN member states suspend or lift measures that have a detrimental effect on human rights and that are aggravating the humanitarian situation. So that's an indirect way of him saying that the UN member states, like the United States and the European Union, need to lift their illegal sanctions on Venezuela. And he notes that that's also true for unilateral coercive measures opposed on other countries like Iran, like Nicaragua, like Zimbabwe, like Eritrea. So 
This is the UN human rights chief, the top UN human rights official condemning Western sanctions and saying that they need to be lifted because they violate the human rights and hurt the economy of Venezuela. These remarks were similar to comments made by the top United Nations expert on sanctions. And this is another statement that was published back in 2021 by the United Nations Human Rights Office, the United Nations Office on the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And these, this was the report that was published by the UN top expert in sanctions. Her name is Elena Duhan, and her official title, it's very long, is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Negative Impact of Unilateral Coercive Measures on the Enjoyment of Human Rights. Whew. So she is the top UN expert on human rights. And in this very long report she released, she acknowledged that the UN sanctions on Venezuela began in 2015, not 2017. So the UN human rights chief actually was misleading in his statement that he just published, where he claimed that the sanctions began in 2017. Clearly, he's not reading the reports of his own colleagues. But anyway, if you go down in this report, she details the, the devastating effect that sanctions have had on the economic and humanitarian situation in Venezuela. She notes Venezuela has one of the largest reserves of oil on the planet, which is one of the reasons why the U.S. has carried out multiple coup attempts to try to overthrow Venezuela's democratic elected government. Going back to 2002, when the U.S. backed a briefly successful military coup against the elected president, Hugo Chavez. And she notes that this top UN, this top UN expert notes that since 2000, the Venezuelan government has implemented social projects, including housing, education, literacy, food, electricity, water supplies, healthcare, family planning, computer literacy, commune development, and that these were implemented at no cost to the people and were substantially subsidized by the state. So she's acknowledging that the Venezuelan government has made huge strides in supporting social services to people. But because the country has been a mono-oriented economy that has been highly dependent on oil sales, that means that a huge part of its economy relies on imports of technology, machine parts, food and medicine. And a lot of those imports came from the United States and Europe, which is explains why the sanctions have been so devastating because Venezuela for a hundred years, well before Hugo Chavez was ever even born, has been a petro state. And the vast majority of its government revenue came from oil sales. So she notes that because of these illegal unilateral sanctions imposed by the West on Venezuela, the Venezuelan government was reported to, sh its government revenue shrank by 99% with the country living on 1% of its pre-sanctions income. So she emphasizes that these sanctions have exacerbated the economic problems in the country. And as a result, the Venezuelan government lost 99% of its revenue. So I, I just really, I always want to stress that fact. This is according to the top UN expert on sanctions in a report published by the UN Office for the High Commissioner for Human Rights. So again, it's very important to, important to stress this, that they acknowledge that these Western sanctions have done serious damage to Venezuela, devastating the Venezuelan economy. So when you hear all this propaganda about socialism and all of this, no, I mean, the reality is it's very easy to explain the economic crisis in Venezuela. This is a country that for a hundred years has relied on oil exports for the vast majority of its exports and for much of its GDP and especially government revenue. So that means that if it can't export oil, again, that's a problem that goes back to the 1930s and 40s before Hugo Chavez was born. I mean, the reality is that if Venezuela cannot export oil, the government cannot fund social programs. And also it means that if it can't export oil, it's difficult for Venezuela to get access to foreign currency, especially dollars, because so much of the global oil market is still done in the US dollar with the petrodollar system because the US pressured Saudi Arabia to do so in the 1970s after the US dollar ended the convertibility of the dollar into gold. So 
Venezuela, if it wants to stabilize its currency and pay for imports, it needs foreign currency, namely U.S. dollars. But because of the illegal U.S. sanctions imposed on it, Venezuela was unable to export its oil. You can see very clearly in data that was published by the U.S. government's Energy Information Administration, the EIA, you can see that Venezuela, Venezuelan oil production was very consistent until in 2015, the Barack Obama administration passed an insane executive order declaring that Venezuela is a, quote, extraordinary and unusual threat to the national security of the United States. And the U.S. began imposing sanctions in 2015. And you can see clearly from the EIA graph that as the U.S. began imposing sanctions on Venezuela, oil production decreased. It had been very consistent until 2016. And since then, it has completely plummeted. And it's easy to explain why. It's because when Venezuela was exporting its oil before the sanctions, foreign clients and foreign investors were not afraid of doing business with Venezuela. But when the U.S. began imposing sanctions, they knew that those U.S. sanctions were going to continue to expand and snowball and grow. And they began, they stopped doing business with Venezuela. This is referred to commonly as over compliance with sanctions. It's not just the official sanctions that are imposed, but also other companies, insurance companies, importers, uh, investors, they're afraid of doing business with Venezuela. So they drop it like a hot potato. And that means it's very difficult for Venezuela to, to be able to find new customers. It's difficult to find insurers that are going to be able to help, you know, um, because they have to export this oil somewhere and they have to pay for insurance for the ships and all of this. It's a very complicated process. So in response to those sanctions, Venezuelan oil production plummeted. And, and that's why in 2019, the U.S. Energy Information Administration boasted, the U.S. government agency boasted that Venezuela, Venezuelan crude oil production fell to the lowest level since 2003, which was right after the U.S.-backed coup and the oil lockout that was led by the opposition against Hugo Chavez. So they, the U.S. helped to devastate Venezuelan oil production. And the friends of the show over at the excellent independent news website Venezuela Analysis created a graph, a very useful graph that shows Venezuela's oil output. And it shows the different sanctions imposed on Venezuela. And you can see that as the U.S. began imposing more and more sanctions, Venezuelan oil output decreased. And that's why, according to the top UN expert in sanctions, Venezuelan government revenue decreased by 99% because it's a country that since the 1930s and 40s has relied on oil production. And this is not a problem unique to Chavismo. It's not because of socialism. So just inform yourself. You can understand when you hear this propaganda claiming that Venezuela is supposedly a back basket case because of socialism. No, you can understand that the main reason is because of the U.S. economic war and also the European economic war, but mostly the U.S. economic war waged on Venezuela. And because Venezuela has been very heavily overly reliant on oil, the Venezuelan government has said this for many years, even before Hugo Chavez died in 2013, the Venezuelan government was trying to diversify its exports, diversify its domestic production, diversify industry, produce more food locally, produce other technologies. But it's very difficult to do that. And it's especially difficult to do that when you're under an economic blockade by the world's superpower, by the world's empire. And it's very difficult when you don't have access to finance. If you want to create new industry, you have to get loans, you have to get finance. And if the U.S. has sanctions on you and you're blockaded from the international financial system, it's extremely difficult to do that. So as you can see from the graph, there has been a slight, uh, you know, stabilization. And since 2021, there's been a slight increase and the Venezuelan economy has been, you know, coming back and it's growing again. According to the Swiss bank Credit Suisse, they estimate 8% GDP growth uh, annually in Venezuela. So they have been slowly recovering after they found out ways around the brutal U.S. sanctions and as the world moves toward a multipolar financial and economic system. Venezuela is collaborating more and more with China and Russia and Iran, the BRICS system, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, as they try to build 
new alternatives to the US dollar, build new financial and economic institutions so countries in the global south can choose their own independent development path. So they don't have to have their economic policies dictated to them by US imperialism, by Washington, by Wall Street. And the main point, the reason I wanted to do this short episode today is to emphasize that the United Nations has repeatedly criticized these illegal Western sanctions on Venezuela, condemned them for exacerbating its economic crisis and hindering human rights. Those are the words of the new UN human rights chief. And this is, of course, completely ignored in Western media, which is why I wanted to highlight it today. I'm Ben Norton of Geopolitical Economy Report. If you want to support the work that we do here, you can go to geopoliticaleconomy.com, geopoliticaleconomy.com slash support, or you can become a patron over at patreon.com slash geopoliticaleconomy. I want to thank everyone for listening or watching. I'll see you all next time. Thanks a lot.